military historian, U.S. Army veteran, and award-winning author Mike Gordia is back on Big Blend Radio. And today he's joining us to talk about war crimes and spies during World War II. Cool. Wow. I couldn't believe, like, this list of people, like, you know, Julia Child, what was she doing? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she's cooking for people. I don't know. But I'm sure he's going to tell us. Mike is the author of over ten books, including Hal Moore, A Soldier Once and Always, American Gorilla, The Forgotten Heroics of Russell W. Volkman, Shadow Commander, The Epic Story of Donald D. Blackburn, The Fires of Babylon Eagle Troop, and The Battle of 73 Easting, Hal Moore on leadership, winning when outgunned and outnumbered, and Crusader General Don Starry and Army of His Times and the Army of His Times. Of course, you can get them all on Amazon, but we say go to his website too, MikeGuardia.com. Uh, Military Mike, welcome back. How are you? It's great to be on the show as always. Yeah, it's good to have you back here. Uh, so now, war crimes. Um, you know, because yes. normally we're talking about your generals. Now I hear that. Mm-hmm. Russell Volkman, um, now he wasn't a spy, but he no. he was connected <laughs> to a spy. Indeed he was, yeah. So the story of Russell Volkman actually begins in the Philippines. If we wind the clocks back to 1941, we're on the verge of entering World War II. Everyone is quite certain that if the Japanese are going to strike first, it's probably not going to be the Philippines, and everyone's a little on edge. Of course, we all know that the... American and Philippine forces got pushed all the way to Bataan, where they ultimately surrendered, and uh, surrendered not by choice. They were given the order to. But among those who surrendered to the Japanese, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Russell Volkman. He was a young captain at the time who refused the order to surrender. Uh, He said, I know what the Japanese do to prisoners of war. I know the atrocities that they're capable of, and if Manchuria was any indication of how they're going to treat the people that they conquer, uh, yeah, I'll take my chances in the jungle before I rely on the good graces of a Japanese POW camp. So what he does is he disappears into the jungle, and for the next three years, he wages a guerrilla war against the Japanese occupation force. And what really makes him thrive is that he learns the art of guerrilla warfare on the fly, and he makes a vast, extensive use of a network of spies and uh, had them spy on Japanese garrisons, had them spy on supply depots, uh, feed him all of the necessary intelligence he needed in order to wear down the Japanese war machine and make it that much easier for the Allies to come back and retake the Philippines. He was rogue, man. I mean, he really was. was, It's interesting about his story and also uh, Donald D. Blackburn and that because – and even Hal Moore, too, right, that they kind of changed – the way the military thought and operated when things like this happen, where it we're going to have to go beyond what we were taught, right? To make things work, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's exactly. He uh, he was an innovator who really had to think on his feet because his life depended on it. Mm, exactly. And how are the communications? I mean, it, when you think that far back without internet, you know, it's like how. I mean, maybe you were just kind of left to your own devices in some areas just because no one could get messages through, possibly. Right. Well, it it was pretty sophisticated for its time. What he did was he ended up using a system of relay messengers, and he would establish these messenger routes all throughout northern Luzon, and uh, he would make sure that no messenger took the same route twice. He had it mapped out as really a series of spider trails that uh, spread from one coast to another, And at each relay station, the person who was on the receiving end would have to receive a certain code word or a certain signal to know that it was a friendly messenger and not someone who had been compromised by the Japanese. So his uh, system of relay messaging worked pretty well for the first two years that he was conducting the guerrilla war. And uh, while he was doing that, he was able to uh, take over the abandoned office of a sawmill company and use the Morse code system and using that radio contact he was able to uh, establish comms with MacArthur's headquarters in Australia. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Cool. Dude. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Running around. So he found a way to make it work. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's creative. And that's really part of it. I mean, is that creativity of how how are you going to make this work? You know, once you're out in the field, you're going to have to do something different. You know, I know we've talked about this on the show with you before, but like, That's what was so fascinating about Shaka Zulu, of how he, I mean, how he changed how they fought and how they took the British down and how they, you know, circled them and, 
You know, it wasn't what they expected. It's the same thing as when we were talking about the Battle of Orleans, you know, when, you mm-hmm. know, how Andrew Jackson got that. I mean, how he fought that and made it, you know, I don't know if somebody else could have taken over his position and to make that work, you know, no. to win that battle. I think it's, a, yeah, it's a, it's a perfect example of the right person being in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And using using everything you have. Yeah, so to outsmart. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So now, okay, so Russell Volkman, everyone, again, uh, you know, Mike has written about him, American Gorilla, see, <laughs> the forgotten heroics of Russell W. Volkman. Uh, re- refresh our memories on that, of how you found out about uh, Volkman. Well, let's see. Uh, I had picked up a two-volume set a uh, long time ago. This was – it's probably around 2006. It was a uh, two-volume set called War in the Shadows, and it was a uh, history of guerrilla warfare from biblical times up until about 1977. I was thumbing through it, and uh, you know, I, I, of course, found a lot of instances of guerrilla warfare that I was familiar with. Um, but then I noticed towards the end of the series, there was this chapter called Allied Resistance Movements in the Philippines. And I was kind of taken aback because, you know, everything in my historical education to that point hadn't mentioned anything about there being any type of guerrilla movement in the Philippines. I mean, all I knew was that in early 1942, Bataan fell to the Japanese. MacArthur got on a speedboat to Australia and said, I shall return. And then three years later, he came back and the Allies retook the Philippines. And that was it. There was pretty much nothing that happened in between. But as I was digging into it, you know, they told me about some of the indigenous guerrilla movements. And then there were only about two paragraphs of this guy that I had never heard of before. His name was Russell Volkman, and he commanded a guerrilla army, like raised a guerrilla army from the ground floor up against the Japanese. Wow. I'm thinking to myself, wow, how did I never hear about this? I started floating yeah. his name to some other historians, and they hadn't heard of him either. So uh, I went about trying to uh, find any of his relatives that were still alive. Maybe I could get some information on this guy. Uh, so I found I found uh, all three of his sons, all all three of whom were still living, and oh. I even found his widow, who was also still alive. And uh, wow. you know they they pretty much just opened the floodgates of all the information that they had of him. And uh, I found out something even more peculiar. Aside from what he did in the Philippines, that he was one of the founding fathers of the Army Special Forces, and you know, yet he remained hmm. largely forgotten by history. Hmm. Wow. So, okay, when you're doing this kind of research and when you start digging in, since you're on a family history show, our third Friday family history show, um, do you do like family trees and do you dig into records and kind of – trace all the family members and and become that kind of researcher? Well, I haven't done any genealogies per se, but I have uh, constructed parts of a family tree as a matter of course when I'm doing the research for any one of my projects. It's always pretty fascinating to find out who's related to who. As a matter of fact, that was one way that I found out that Hal Moore had a big military presence going all the way back to Virginia in like the 1600s, and he even had a he had uh, had blood relatives who had fought in the Civil War. Wow, that's crazy! I know. <laughs> when you start looking at it, and you start wow. tracing people's family, and it's it it is you know how many people find out they're you know related to Washington or something, and it's like wow, right. you <laughs> know the the father of America, I'm related to him in some way, you know how it all trickles right. down. Eventually, we'll find out we're all connected, right? So it's. Mm-hmm. It's interesting when you start to dig in. Do you look at things like prison records and census records, or are you going mostly through military records when you do your research? Uh, mostly through military records. I've, I've referenced mm-hmm. a census report or two, but most of what I have comes from either family records or military records. Mm-hmm. That's interesting, yeah, because mm-hmm. military is going to be pretty straight up. You know what I mean? It's different than sometimes you go through a newspaper, mm-hmm. start reading newspaper yeah, reports, and, and newspapers can do what they want. <laughs> yeah, they can send you way off on mm-hmm. the wild goose chase. It's just like, you know, Benjamin Franklin's yeah. album next. You uh-huh. know, he yeah. wrote what he wanted. He wanted to entertain people. Probably way different between yeah. military records. and. Yeah, that's it's fascinating. A friend of ours, um, Bob Wilson, Robert Michael Wilson, mm-hmm. he is a mm-hmm. uh, retired sheriff from L.A., and, um, he's you know, he went out and started tracing all the crimes of the West, the Wild West, the stage and the hangings, the stagecoach and... robberies, and he found out that half the newspaper reports were wrong. And he yeah. would actually, like, go to the place and look at, you know, what would have happened where, 
and he's had entire towns like freak out about him. He goes <laughs> like Wickenburg, Arizona. Yes. There was a massacre, and he'd go in and say, "So and so did." He'd walk in a restaurant and say, "The Mexicans did it," and everybody will freak out. Or, "Hey, yes. it was the Indians," and everybody will freak out because everyone believes, and they're still fighting over it to this day. Who started the massacre? Yeah. And uh, he got hooked into it, and he's just gone into. I mean, there's some brutal stuff that has happened in this country. I mean, everywhere. And I think World War II, we saw some crazy things happen. Well, not us personally, but there were some really brutal things that happened, especially if you were a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. Were there laws back then? Because, you know, I've heard and read stories about, you know, American prisoners of war and then, like, the Japanese would put, like, bamboo shoots under their fingernails and mm -hmm. drip water on their oh, heads yeah. and stuff like that. Is that stuff true, or mm -hmm. am I watching movies <laughs> that I get this wrong? Uh, no, sadly, sadly, that is true. And uh, even more sad is that that's not even the worst of it, really. Some of the conversations that I had with Blackburn's family and uh, what ended up in a lot of Blackburn's personal papers were some of the more horrific things that the Japanese were doing to Americans. A lot of these were echoed by survivors of the Bataan Death March. It would make you a little squeamish to talk about this, but just to give you a representative example, one of the Japanese's weapons of choice was the bayonet, and they were particularly creative with uh, how they would uh -oh. use the bayonet. They would take the edge of a bayonet that was still attached to a rifle and they would put it underneath the eyelid of an American soldier oh, where, no. where they would tuck it inside. Yeah, they would tuck it inside the eyelid and then they would Dude. let go. Well, you know, gravity does all the work to where the rifle becomes the lever and the point of the bayonet becomes the fulcrum and then out pops that guy's eye. No, Nancy's no, totally freaking no. out. She's totally grossed out, man. No, <laughs> no but that is gross. Right. I mean, it's it, that that's, is that's that disgusting. is disgusting. That is gross. So now, yeah. would that be labeled as a war crime internationally, or was it just everybody had a piece of each other at that point? Like with those kind of well. hor horrific things. I mean, would that be labeled as? I mean, the Holocaust. That there was some. That was war crimes, right? But when it comes to right. I mean, there's genocides. Even look at Rwanda, right? Look what happened in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. They were just, oh, no, God, the, the Rwanda was yeah. terrible. Um, right. And we're still having that happen in countries right now, you know? Um, but mm -hmm. isn't this why we ended up with the Geneva Convention? Wasn't that? Absolutely. Brought into, yeah, so that even mm -hmm. you may be at war, but the, the war crimes, you, I don't know what happens if you can try a country for war crimes under the Geneva Convention. I mean, what? Yes. What do you? Do? <laughs> you can, but then mm -hmm. what? Do you, you're not putting the whole country in jail. Yeah. Yeah. So how? Well, I no, mean, no. Well, it, hmm. after World War II, the Geneva Convention was really a consolidated effort to try to make the militaries and governments of all of the world's nations accountable for any of the really bad things that they did during wartime. Now, mm -hmm. before the Geneva Conventions, there were some international laws on the books, but you know they were pretty fluid, and uh, to a great extent, not a lot of them were truly enforceable. I mean, it was the long-standing notion of, hey, every country, every country has its own sovereignty; they can pretty much do what they want. You're only really bound by treaties and contracts that you make with other nations. So, international law, as it was at that point, was still kind of in its infancy. And, mm -hmm. you know, people would also say, OK, well, war by its very nature is supposed to be brutal. I mean, yeah, there are established uh, unwritten rules of conduct and, you know, gentlemen are supposed to fight a certain way. But you could have a country in Europe that goes to war with a country in Asia. They come from two different mm -hmm. cultures and they may not see eye to eye on what exactly is acceptable conduct and warfare. So after all of the atrocities of World War II came to light, not the least of which was the Holocaust, that's when a lot of the post-industrial world came together and said, well, okay, uh, let's have some type of international convention that makes sure that things this bad don't happen again. So we'll have right. the UN on one hand that will you know, try and de-escalate conflicts before they go to war. But if diplomacy fails, well, hey, let's have this uh, roundabout set of laws that says, okay, you can kill, but you know, if you go into a town and just start mowing down civilians, well, that in and of itself is a war crime. You can't do that. You can only kill someone who's identified as a combatant. Hmm. So what about, yeah, because women and children, right, isn't that the first thing you want to move them right. out, right? But then some, yeah. you know, uh -huh. rape, pillage, and plunder when they go into a village, you know? Right. And, and, and some Americans have been bad. Got called on. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the, that, the Japanese. And what mm-hmm. about on the Americans? Because I've, you know, heard some things, you know, I'm, I'm you know, just reading and then um, also watching movies and stuff. But some Americans have been bad. But they have. Um, you know, even when the wars that we have been fighting have been just and when they have been necessary, you've always had a swath of every branch of service that has acted dishonorably. And as mm-hmm. a matter of fact, Lisa, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a good segue into a uh, little known place at a World War I cemetery called Plot E. Plot mm-hmm. E is, is a very little known plot of graves that is behind the superintendent's house at a World War I cemetery. And now keep in mind, the cemetery is for World War I veterans except for Plot E. Those are World War II veterans, and uh, all of the graves that are on Plot E, which is completely hidden from view, are the names of what they call the dishonored dead. And they're World War II veterans who were executed for war crimes in the European theater. Wow. And uh, a lot of these men were draftees. A lot of these men uh, came from every walk of life, and they were executed mostly by hanging, although if you were executed by firing squad, Uh, for various war crimes to include atrocities against the local European civilians. Some of the inhabitants of Plot E, I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you some names. Mm -hmm. Uh, Probably the most notorious person who was interned in Plot E is the father of a young man named Emmett Till. Some of your listeners probably remember Emmett Till as a little African-American boy who was killed down in Mississippi mm-hmm. back in 1955, mm-hmm. and that's what touched off the greater civil rights movement. Well, a little-known footnote to history is that Emmett Till's father was a man named Lewis Till. But Lewis Till, to put it lightly, he had a lot of run-ins with the law. And in 1942, after – I think he got picked up for robbery, uh, the judge gave him a choice. He said, you can go to war or you can go to jail. It's up to you. Wow. So Lewis Till – chose to go to war. He got drafted. He was serving in an all-black unit, and his unit was in Italy where you know, his criminal instincts, I think, got the better of him again, and he ended up killing two Italian women. Wow. So wow. Uh, they – yeah, so Louis Till was promptly picked up by the MPs. They threw him in jail. Cellmate was a well-known radical named Ezra Pound. And, no uh, way. And if any of your listeners know – yep. Yep, he was yeah. cellmates with Ezra Pound. And later, Ezra Pound, at, yeah, yep, the poet. Wow. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Lewis Till was executed by hanging, um, but the War Department officially told his widow that he had been killed in action. And it wasn't until after Emmett Till died that the real truth about his father's story came out. And a lot of Southern journalists were trying to use that as an example of, see, the apple doesn't far too fall from the tree, so this kid deserved to die anyway. You know, I mean, oh. it, I mean, just, just horrible things that they were using with the story for their own effect. Wow. Uh, so Lewis Till, yeah, so Lewis Till, he's probably the most infamous person who was interred there. And there was another gentleman. Um, I, I'm not sure if you saw that Martin Sheen movie. It came out back in the 70s called The Execution of Private Slovak. No, oh, that sounds familiar. Huh. But I want to watch yeah. that. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that was one of Martin Sheen's earliest films. Um, but Eddie Slovic, uh, he was a small time criminal from Detroit. And, uh, you know, he, he had gotten in trouble throughout his youth. You know, and it was pretty much petty crimes that he had did. You know, I mean, like he would steal candy from a store or, you know, like he would break into a business and steal stuff. Uh, petty crimes. He was in and out of juvenile detention a lot as a kid, and because of his criminal record, at the start of the war, he was classified as 4F. But you know, as the need for manpower grew, the War Department lifted mm. his 4F status and redesignated him 1A. They're like, okay, we don't care if you have a criminal record. You have all 10 fingers and all 10 toes. You can stand on your own two feet. Okay, congratulations. You're going overseas. So he goes through mm. basic training, and he, he gets there really in the last few months of the war. He gets there, I think, in February of 1945, and he's there as a replacement. He's about to he, you know, he's about to join his unit on the front lines. Uh, but about the, the second or third day or whatever it was that he was with his unit, uh, he got shelled by German artillery. And uh, this just scared the ever-living bejesus out of him. Uh, He was like on a shell shock high for about three days straight. 
And he finally just said, I, I, I can't do this. I can't go into combat. I'm, I'm not cut out for this, man. If I, I'm too scared. If you send me up against the Nazis, I swear I'm going to run away. So, uh, you know, he had made up his mind that he didn't want to do this. And he said, okay, well, if I desert or if I, you know, just refuse to mm-hmm. obey orders, then the worst they're going to do is just throw me into a military prison. I've been to prison before. It's really not that bad. Uh, I'll take that over getting blown up by a German artillery shell. He uh, writes down his intentions on a note. He gives it to a cook and says, hey, cook, give this to the commanding officer. And uh, then Private Slovak takes off running in the other direction. Well, authorities catch up to him a few days later, and they offer him a chance. They're like, look, okay, we know you're a new soldier. We know you're probably shell-shocked. Well, look, everybody around here feels the same way you do. We're going to give you a chance to tear up this note and go back to your unit with a clean slate. And Slovak said, no, I've made up my mind. I'll take my court-martial. Well, they court-martialed him, and he was expecting to get a lengthy sentence inside a military prison, which was par for the course for people who had deserted. Mm -hmm. But uh, desertion had become such a problem in the European theater that once it got up to Eisenhower, he said, you know what? I need to make an example out of someone so Uh people will stop trying to run away. So, uh, So Eisenhower approved the execution order, and he was the only soldier in the European theater who was executed for a purely military offense. Everyone else who deserted got jail sentences, and most of them were commuted after the war ended, Um, but they sent Private Slovak to the firing squad, and his last words, his last known words, were to the priest who was saying the last rites as they were tying tying up to the post. He said, hey, Eddie, God be with you. And Eddie just looked at the priest and said, you too, Father. I hope you don't join me soon afterwards. Whoa. Mm. Yeah. I do yeah. remember Staying this life. story. I think I did see that movie. Yeah. It sounds familiar. Mm-hmm. Lovick, yeah. he got buried in Plot E for quite a few years. I think he was there for 40 years until his widow. She had been petitioning the government for quite a while to get his remains returned back stateside. And finally, it was President Reagan who signed off on the authorization to have Eddie Slovak assumed and ha- have his body shipped back to the United States, where I think he's buried in New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. 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 We're going to have yeah. to watch for this on our tour, our Love Your Park tour. We're going to have to go so graveyard hopping, which yeah, we like doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Man, you know, Military Mike, these are some crazy stories. I do want to know what Julia Child was cooking up yeah. as a spy. How did she oh. spy? Yes. Okay, so the name Julia Childs, uh, I'm sure for everyone, evokes the images of a home cooking show. You know, this yes. uh, I think we can trace the lineage of HGTV, also cooking with Emerald, and pretty much uh, anything, anything having to do with TV cooking, all the way back to Julia Childs. Uh, you know, yes. she was uh, she was really the forebearer of every home cooking show that we know today, and. Mm-hmm. Her debut cookbook was called Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and she just took it to a whole new level. You know, I mean, she had the French chef, which premiered all the way back in 1963. Despite her legacy, what a lot of people don't know is that uh, she had joined the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, during World War II. And she only did that after she had been turned down for enlistment in the Navy. And uh, she had also tried to enlist in the WACs, the, uh, the Women's Army Corps. Mm -hmm. So having been turned down for both of those organizations, she offered her service to to the OSS. And what she had out in the course of a lot of her cooking experiments was that she uh, had developed uh, some combination of chemicals to make a shark repellent. Wow. A shark, yeah. Of all things, a shark repellent. So what she did was... uh, Yeah, stick your toe in the water and find out. Right. Right. So she, um, what she did was uh, she worked as an assistant for developers of a team who were making shark repellent. And, uh, you know, at, at first one might ask, you know, what would shark repellent have to do with anything that we're doing in the war? I mean, I, you know, what military yeah. purpose is there for shark repellent? It actually turned out that this was a, a pretty big problem in the North and Mid-Atlantic because uh, sharks were attacking a lot of underwater mines and a lot of depth charges that were intended for German U-boats. Oh. You know, yeah. What would happen is you would have a battleship group or you would have a cruiser or 
a frigate of some sort, you know, that was um, off the coast of Spain or maybe off the coast of Iceland, and they would be dropping these depth charges, you know, to go after these German submarines. Well, if you have a school of sharks that get eyes on this depth charge that's going down, they really don't know what it is, but, you know, their instincts tell them, oh, hey, that's food, you know, that's something that we can eat. So then you have a massacred school of great white sharks instead of a blown up U boat. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. So this yeah. is like a shark. Right. Oh wow. my gosh. So you have to watch, you know, the enemy and the shark. Like you know, mm-hmm. I I grew up around great white sharks in South Africa. Ned and I I had shark friends nets. <laughs> I they would jump the shark net. <laughs> exactly. I you know, you'd your friends would go surfing and sometimes come back with no arm or leg. And you know, when a great white wants, to, there's like the sardine run that would happen, and oh, when the yeah. and the great whites mm-hmm. would come out, you they, they would go out on the sharks board in these boats and like literally club them back. There's uh uh-uh, uh heck no. I remember being out once on mm-hmm. a rubber dinghy out there, and we got circled by hammerhead sharks, and you're out there, <laughs> and I'm like. No, <laughs> you know, and then my friends dived in because they're all scuba divers and, you know, they, they were, you know, into all that stuff. And I'm like, but I'm on the boat. My friend and I <laughs> both were sitting there be, we're like, we're being girls. <laughs> I'm so scared. I mean, it's like, you know, just if they touch, you know, with their teeth, you know, but, and the great whites, that's what right. scared me is like, okay, if some, you know, if they smell something, but they came in like packs, like yes. no kidding. Mm-hmm. They came in like packs after the fish jumped. or certain seasons. Yeah, the sardine runs. The, it, it, and they, they would mm-hmm. jump the, the the nets no problem. You and I'm all stand on the down. shore mm-hmm. and see them. And then you're like, that's too many sharks. I'm never going swimming again. But they did. As a kid, we used to go and, and, <laughs> and go out and always go past where you're supposed to just out of that I did it, and I didn't get bitten by a shark. How crazy is that? <laughs> That's what we used to do in the beach. But anyway, I know there was that one beach known for it, and I, yeah. I, so yeah. So now Josephine Baker, I heard that she was smuggling secrets for the French. I mean, there, there's some interesting people. I know we just did a segment on the doll woman spy. You know, so women ended up doing things. And you know, right. so but Julia helps with this with the shark thing. But did she, I mean? That was a positive, right, for us. That wasn't anything, right, like bad, or was it? No, no, mm. no, not at all. Okay, so she was Smart okay. lady. Yes, yeah, she is. She's she's cool. Now, what about um, yeah. this Virginia Hall lady? I heard that she's got a limp, like she was known as the limping lady or something. <laughs> yeah, so. The story of Virginia Hall uh, is really a fascinating one, and I think what makes it more remarkable is that, you know, she accomplished everything that she did uh, during a time when, you know, it was expected and in some places even mandatory that a woman's role was in the home and that women Mm. did not seek any type of outside employment. Mm. Well, Mm. this lady, Virginia Hall, she was a nurse by trade, but she is the only woman in history, and uh, I think probably the only person in history to get three prestigious awards from three separate governments. She was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross by the U.S. She was named a member of the British Embassy by the U.K. She also received the Croix de Guerre from the French government. So she got the second highest award for valor from the U.S., and then she got the highest honors from France and Britain. And wow. she did this while she was a spy with both the American OSS and the British Special Operations Executive. And it just remarkable things that she was able to accomplish. You know, she um, – they called her the limping lady because, uh, you know, actually she had an artificial leg. So here she is doing all of this, uh, all of this great spy work while she's wearing a prosthetic. She had wanted to parachute behind enemy lines, but they said, well, no, because of your prosthetic leg, we can't risk that. So what we'll do is we'll just put you in a landing craft ashore. And uh, under her code name, her code name was Diane, and uh, she she eluded German forces. She eluded the Gestapo and made contact with the French resistance, and she mapped out drop zones for supplies and commandos from Great Britain. And she also had a network of safe houses set up. And she linked up with the Jagbird teams uh, that landed after the Normandy invasion. You know, she uh, she helped train three whole battalions of French resistance uh, forces to wage wow. guerrilla warfare against the Germans. And uh, yeah, she lived to tell about the tale. Uh, in 1950, 
she actually married one of her fellow OSS agents, and uh, she uh, hung in there for quite a while. She she died in 1982 at the age of 76, mm-hmm. but uh, wow. yeah, her her legacy lives on as uh, one tough cookie. <laughs> wow. You know, and that Josephine Baker, that's what she was doing. She was working with the French Resistance, mm-hmm. too, you know. But I've heard that Julia Child, going back to her, that she moved papers around. Like, she she handled some special papers, and... Um, you know, so that she touched a little bit, but she wasn't like a spy spy. It's not like, you know, some of the other ones. No, Sterling Hayden, who's that? Well, he was not only a uh, OSS operative, but he was also a Hollywood actor. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, mm-hmm. he, he, his most memorable role, I think, was uh, as General Jack Ripper in the oh. old movie Dr. Strangelove. Cool. Yeah, so yeah. he was in that. Um, yeah, he he also had roles in Asphalt Jungle, and uh, he was in one of Stanley Kubrick's earliest films, The Killing. Mm. Man, and he ended up yeah. with this wild, yeah. crazy beard, man. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's so it's interesting because there's like these celebrities, right? There's, you know, Roald Dahl, uh-huh. the the uh, writer, uh, Morris Moberg. I'm just looking at this list online here. Graham Greene, the novelist. So it seems that there's these creative people and these celebrity icons, Julia Child, the chef, you know. Um, mm-hmm. It's just as interesting to me how they were all part of it, but you know, when you think about World War II, weren't we all part of it? If we were here and of age, everybody did something somewhere, even if it wasn't right. the right thing to do. There was, you know, some mm-hmm. naughty things. But um, And Arthur Goldberg, he was part of this too. So it's kind of interesting that with all of these people doing things, um, yeah, that it's these celebrities that are in there doing it because you don't think that you just go oh look there's a nice movie what a great well, book certainly they entertain troops mm-hmm. you know great poetry right. things you know mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly uh, but so was he did he spy or what did Sterling Hayden do well uh, he had actually just started off in Hollywood when the war broke out and he had been in two films I think at this point and then after Pearl Harbor he at first he listed in the army. And uh, then he then he deployed to England, but uh, he broke his ankle while he was in Britain. And because of the severity of the injury, they ended up medically discharging him from the Army. But when he returned to the U.S., he wasn't daunted at all. He said, okay, well, if the Army kicked me out, let me try the Marine Corps, and I'll just stay hush-hush about my erstwhile ankle injury. So he, he ended up joining the Marine Corps as a private, and uh, while he was undergoing boot camp at Paris Island, he uh, accepted into officer candidate school. So he was accepted as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, and then he uh, transferred to uh, the OSS, where he started training under Wild Bill Donovan. And while he was an OSS agent, took up a pseudonym, um, and oddly enough, a lot of his records actually appear under his pseudonym, his pseudonym which was John Hamilton. And uh, what he would do is he would use his uh, experience sailing boats, and he would take these schooners, and he would sail supplies from Italy to the Yugoslavian partisans, you know, who were fighting the Nazis in the Balkans. Wow, wow. And then, so he was working with um, Wild Bill, right? William Donovan and... Yep. So mm-hmm. while Bill was above him. Right. Yeah. And uh, he apparently was uh, such an enormous help to the Yugoslavian partisans that Marshal Tito himself commended Hayden for uh, he commended Hayden for his bravery. And uh, he is one of the few Americans, I think, if not the only American who was ever awarded the Yugoslavian Order of Merit. Wow. So this is why everyone's getting connected, because everybody did. They united against what Mm -hmm. was going on. And so William Donovan, Wild Bill, so this is, you know, after Wild Bill Hickok, right? (laughs) You've got a lot of Wild Bills running around. Who was he? What was he up to? Okay. Well, William Joseph Donovan, uh, otherwise known by his nom de guerre, which is Wild Bill, an incredible man, had, had accomplished so much. I mean, he was a lawyer. He was a diplomat. He was an intelligence officer. Uh, he had accomplished uh, so much in his early life. So fought in World War One, and who came around? Mm-hmm. That's when he was assigned by President Roosevelt, no less, to be the director of of the Office of Information. And Donovan's mm-hmm. title was Coordinator of Information. And you know, the, 
the U.S. government really didn't have a formal spy agency at this point. So Bill Donovan was really the guy who was, you know, piecing together uh, the framework of what would eventually become the CIA. And, uh, you know, there was so much overlap between the OSS and the U.S. military because a lot of the OSS personnel were pretty much on loan from the military. And, uh, you know, there was military personnel that uh, populated most of its ranks. But uh, you know, coordinating all coordinating all of the paramilitary activities, coordinating all of the uh, all of the surveillance and spy missions, all of that was coming out of the OSS, and uh, it was it was really Bill Donovan who was you know creating the framework as he went along. Wow, I had no idea. And then you had the CIA, and then later we had Jack Bauer on Twenty Four. <laughs> yeah. I like I like Twenty Four back when it was on. That was oh, good. Yeah. That was good, especially the beginning show. part of it. Yeah, Jack yeah. Bauer. Mm-hmm. He always had that, you know, little bag, but he he could jump off of buildings. He was like he jumped off a ton of buildings. He was like the MacGyver of the CIA, he did right? That jump, roll, uh-huh. and stand up and run again. Yeah, and and listen, <laughs> can't we just keep MacGyver where MacGyver was, like back in the day? Why do we have to recreate it? You know, MacGyver <laughs> right. was MacGyver. I'm sorry, I have a thing about those shows, the old, you know, the A Team, MacGyver. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Kit, I need you. <laughs> Oh, no. What's that? What was that? That's Night Rider. Night Rider. Asian sorry. Okay, I've gone off on a tangent. Sorry. <laughs> That's not a good one. No, no. But the A team were cool. They were cool. Come on, Mr. T. Yeah, he was cool. Come on. Yeah. Did you ever watch any of those shows, Mike? Oh, of course. Okay, I knew you had to. Come on, Mr. Yeah. T. Yeah. yeah. He was yeah. like, he was cool. Okay, let, <laughs> I'm gonna get us back on track here. Sorry. You know, this is this is how I would fight a war. I'd get Mr. T, <laughs> see if he would fit in Knight Rider. But they had that van. Remember that van when they'd drive around yeah. the A team? Had mm-hmm. their own van, right? And I'd have MacGyver. Okay, so last one is Art Schlesinger. So tell us about him. What, do we, what did he do? Okay. Well, uh, the name Art Schlesinger, uh, for most folks, I think, probably probably evokes the image of a historian, was a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think he was the youngest person in history to win a Pulitzer, um, won that back in the late 40s. And, uh, you know, he did, uh, he, he's done a number of spectacular biographies on p- people such as FDR. Uh, he did one on JFK. He did one on Bobby Kennedy. Really a heavyweight in the historical scholarly community. But mm-hmm. what I think fewer people know is uh, that he also did his time in the OSS. So he uh, he had wanted to be in the Army, tried to enlist. Turns out that he failed his military medical examination, uh, oh. which was pretty thorough. And uh, they said, I'm sorry, but uh, you're not qualified to be in the military based on these items that we see. So instead, he said, "Okay, well, if I can't join the military proper, I'll do something else that I know is going to be of equal importance to our national security and equally important to winning this war. So that's when he joins what is originally the Office of War Information, which eventually becomes the OSS. And in that regard, Schlesinger was an analyst. Now, wasn't a uh, spy on the front lines per se, but what he would do is he would interpret the raw data that the spies were sending back and synthesize it into a coherent into a coherent narrative for all of our policymakers to make decisions on. And uh, you know, that's uh, you can see that having a historian and having an author like. Author Schlesinger is probably the best man to have for that job since, you know, he can, wow. if he can knock out, you know, these epic tomes of literature in 90 days or less, just imagine what he can do inside of two yeah. weeks with a bunch of intelligence reports. Yeah. Man. How cool. Cool. That is so uh-huh. cool. That's what I find so interesting is, you know, reading code and, and all of that, you know, and, and uh, it just how it's changed over the years, but yet you're still – Whoever's doing the code, you're still dealing with human beings doing something, so yep. you can still kind of go back to what humans do, right? Even though the people writing yeah. the code are trying to thwart that, there's still, mm-hmm. you know, there's like there's a vibe to things. Don't mm-hmm. you? Don't, doesn't gut instinct play on things like that of understanding oh, of code and, and knowing when to do something? Is that if gut you know, feeling? Who you know who it came from? Yeah, and you, and you know that culture, or you know you know that 
for example, somebody in Germany is going to do something different than mm-hmm. someone in Japan. Mm-hmm. Wow. And think differently. Mm-hmm. But it's still humans. Humans. Yeah. But those that bayonet thing's going to stick with me, man. No, I don't like that. Literally, that just still <laughs> freaking me out. No, it's freaking. I thought the bamboo under mm-hmm. the fingernails was bad, but I didn't know about the bayonet thing. Yeah. So, keep up with Mike at MikeGuardia.com. And uh, keep listening to him on Big Blend Radio. You can go to blendradioandtv.com, see him in our expert department. He's also, uh, if you go into uh, nationalparktraveling.com, just type in Mission Possible or type in Military Mike. <laughs> you know, you'll find our stories that we're doing as we travel the country and then we connect with Military Mike and say, hey, you know, we found this general story or we're trying to follow in the footsteps of Hal Moore, uh, also Russell Volkman, and Donald D. Blackburn, and uh, to just go where they've been in America. So um, I surely do not want to go back in time where they were because some of those places sound brutal and scary. So we really appreciate what they have done for our our lives here. Uh, But, again, MikeGuardia.com, he's on Twitter.